take their seats, or we could just keep on doing this, but I think, um, could you please have a seat? Hello, and welcome to the uh, presidential plenary portion of our program. Um, partly due to a failure of email, God knows where. Um, unfortunately, the titles and presenters were not printed in the program, so I have to apologize for that. And people have been coming up to me all day surreptitiously saying, what's it about? So you'll just have to wait and find out. <laughs> you can't hear me, okay, is that better? Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, the, the general title, of both the theme of the conference and this plenary is ways of knowing. I purposely did not call it other ways of knowing since I think we're all other ways of knowing. Um, and I think that's very important to the points that we have to make today at the plenary. In a sense, this is also part two of a plenary that began last year, some of you were were there. Um, the topic last year in Vancouver was silence, suffering, and survival. And of course that's deeply interconnected with ways of knowing. I also want to say that last year, for those of you that remember, I talked about um, a bobcat that I met in my front yard. And uh, Mary Weaver was kind enough to dub it my cat Bob. And uh, not knowing Bob's gender, I guess that's okay too, but um, or maybe intersex, but Bob is fine. I just want you to know, I've seen, I've seen him or her or her um, three times in the last year, which is a record. I'd only ever seen Bob twice in the previous uh, decade. One way of knowing occurs deeply within and across layers of experience. And this is something we all share, and I think we need to talk more about these kinds of practices. I'm talking about the process of coding, or naming, or thematizing a phenomenon, and thus making it data. There are, to grossly simplify, two parts of this process. The first is an almost innocent, um, full of feeling affection for something. Um, an immediate attraction, a kind of buzz that one feels about an area of investigation, usually dismissed as motivating factor or hunch or initial guts to, to look at something. It's, but this is especially true in, in our fields, which are so profoundly interdisciplinary. And often we create the map as we go. This attraction, this merger with an object of some sort, the conversion of the object into a kind of, of me-ness, um, M-E-ness, you go, this is my problem. Here is where I belong. And it is falling in love. It's just like falling in love. Just like falling in love, however, there is a lovely begin a bit of beginning and promise but as with romantic love, it's a lovely bit of, of honeymoon um, in the best cases. What begins almost immediately right after that is the process of who's gonna do the housework? Separating, differentiating. What about this is not me? That is, making the abstract, the fitting of this over a long period of time into conventions, traditions, the market, um, the demands of the professions, uh, the demands of analyzing and then writing something up. We actually know very little, I think, about how the two things work together and continue to recurse and to iterate again and again over the period of a, the lifetime of a scholar. The first instance of falling in love, the second instance of working back and forth from the love to the doing of the practices, including making things abstract. 
oh, sorry, it's a new computer, and there's always some little device that you don't understand, which is one of the things I write about. What is more often than not erased in the process is especially the emotions involved and how they transmute over time. What, what makes, what goes from the date to the partnership um, or marriage, however you want to construe it, but a lifetime commitment to each other. Those feelings don't go away, those falling in love feelings, but they're often relegated to the shadows of some sort of other, and they're often considered embarrassing and not to be talked about. And in trying to understand this very important piece for our own work, but also in, of course, analyzing science, um, one person that's been very helpful to me is the object relations psychologist D.W. Winnicott, who many years ago wrote of transitional objects um, of things like separation anxiety, which I know I feel every time I go to make a code, am I going to violate this experience of being in love, or am, go am I going to make it last longer and become something else? I came to sociology of science as a, as a pragmatist and as a feminist at the beginning of what would later be called the science wars, a bitter, divisive brawl where constructivist theorists, relativists, or whatever you want to call us, were, were pitted against the realism of science. Positivist scientists saw the work of much of the new program of sociology of science, roughly beginning in the late 70s, as anti-science. And there was, I need not review the history for most of you here, um, you know, laughing at us. If I jump out of the window, will I fall to the ground? Are you saying anything could happen anywhere? Um, and I don't, I really don't need to review that, that history here. I do want to say, though, that um, in, a, in a certain sense, pragmatists came to that debate with a different set of tools than some of the other scientific traditions that were represented in it, such as SSK um, and ethnomethodology. It's a different um, philosophical division. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm just not used to this particular little thingy. Okay. If con constructivists were, for the most part, interested in exploring the meaning of, say, falling as culturally constituted, of injury in the body as having different meanings in different times and places, then there's nothing to say that that doesn't belong in the understanding of falling off a building. The world, as it had been explained by scientists at that time, appeared both brutal and universalist, in, and both of those at the same time, except perhaps for art, religion, you know, that stuff. Um, and reactive in just the way that John Dewey, the famous pragmatist philosopher, saw in his famous paper on the reflex arc model. It's not that information comes in and kind of floats around and then goes out. There's a constant interaction with the environment, with the community, with meaning making. Delicately dissecting, situating, and making the world ontologically and epistemologically open to revision was not of interest to these traditional um, science um, warriors, shall we say, and I'm not, I'm not talking about the forest side. Often citing Nazi science, um, Lysenkoism, as examples of what may happen as a result of relativism or constructivism, this group of scientists ridiculed sociology of science as if we were somehow know-nothing yahoos who sought to ridicule science. From the pragmatist point of view, the response to this quarrel is to examine questions of responsibility, location, consequences, authorship. Pragmatists recognize universalism as agreements across a large number of communities of practice and cultures, nothing more and nothing less. It, do, they don't, it doesn't exist in some a priori analytic reality. That was what we refused to buy off on. Um, we believe that people always interpret events, and that from a situated and complexly principled point of view, 
For example, death means the end for some rationalists, for some religions. For others, it's a transition. For others, a transformation um, that we all undergo. We certainly all experience it. If one respects, profoundly respects interpretation, they're not, however, universal in the sense of the a priori um, analytic structures. Those things with powerful scope and the only form of nature that is there, to use George Herbert Mead's provocative uh, comments, and talk about that in just a second, means that as an analyst, the confidence and authority accumulated by attachment, separation, transition, um, uncountable um, times, sometimes recursing, sometimes accruing. I myself have to let my data percolate. I talk about a lot of kitchen metaphors. Um, and that's just as important as doing the analysis and knowing when something is percolated is extremely important and something I know at least as much in my body as anywhere else. Another thing to, to study is how different um, mousing techniques get in, ingrained in your fingers and your body. We've just um, had, for those of you that were able to be there, an author meets critic in the um, work of, of my partner, Jeff Bowker, um, talking about his, his new book, Memory Practices in the Science. He analyzes the continually changing nature of the past, which is another thing that has been made, I think relative is much too mild a word, opened up and, and problematized and made um, complexly layered in ways that are very important, very important. Um, if one were, for example, a victim of rape or incest at a young age, one of the things that happens to you is that you often question, did it really happen? I have these memories that aren't, that didn't grow up, except as the, in the retelling. Not always, but often. And, you know, one of the things that, that was really comforting to me in opening up the past in that sense was that I may never know, in my case, the example of what happened to me, but I'm comforted by the idea that the past is full of open pathways um, in which I can experience and come to different understandings of it over time. Now, I'll conclude with just a brief um, couple of things from two of my mentors, John Dewey, who I actually cried when I found out he was dead already um, after I'd read some of his stuff. Um, Speaking to the gap between the romantic story of the past and the messy, attached, feelingful past, how it can be also just in its own right, painful and misleading, just as can pluralistic ignorance, meaning the thing of I must be the only one who feels this or have ever felt it. Dewey said in Experience and Nature, romanticism is an evangel in the garb of metaphysics. It sidesteps the painful, toilsome labor of understanding and of control, which changes, sets us, by glorifying it for its own sake. Flux, he's speaking of change, is made something to revere, something, something profoundly akin to what is best within ourselves, will and creative energy. It is not, as it really is in experience, a call to effort, a challenge to investigation, a potential doom of disaster and death. I think Dewey being the perennial optimist, I'm not so sure about the, the um, I, I am sure that he's right about revering flux and the evangel um, of metaphysics. But the vis visceral terror of authority in research can really feel sometimes like disaster and death. And part of that comes from the attempt, 
As another favorite philosopher of mine, George Herbert Mead, would say, to nail down the agreement um, of what really is and what was and what will be. Uh, Mead wrote a, a wonderful um, essay. Um, he wrote many wonderful essays, but he wrote one called um, The Objective Reality of Perspectives, 1927, um, sort of predating um, a lot of the work about this in, in STS. Um, and what he challenges us to do is to develop a suite of practices. I think they're both spiritual, intellectual, and embodied. They're both individual and collective. To decenter our own assumptions, to constantly remind us to take the role of the other, um, the risk of adding different studies together, of really listening to each other, or as feminist Nell Morton would say, listening forth. The, follow, the various paths connected to science, technology, medicine, and information. The risk is that we will fall into a confused compilation of theories, lists, and measure them according to the conventional world of academia. The joy, the goal, the love is for me to understand what I write as a wild imaginative window on the world and to also acknowledge the courage that takes and to provide tools and support for students to make that leap. There's an awful lot of fear of the market that drives conventionalism in social science. The plenary today is, is full of wonderful people who have many things to say about this way of looking at the world. <laughs> Plus my cursor, <laughs> sorry. It just goes away. Um, <coughs> we're going to begin today with uh, Professor Gail Hornstein, who's a professor of psychology and women's studies at Mount Holyoke College, who for years has worked on telling tales of forgotten and despised ways of knowing in psychiatry, psychology, and in the worlds of, of love, information, and imagination of those called mentally ill um, mental patients, or people who struggle with illnesses of perception and of the soul exacerbated often by how they are not listened to. And she'll be talking about madness from the outside in. Visibly. Wow. Add, adds oh, a, a certain poetic touch to Gail's talk. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ellen Balka from Simon Fraser University, who has studied a lot of different things. Um, most recently, a series of papers on triage in hospitals that's quite extraordinary and useful, specifically looking at indicators and how one makes decisions about diagnoses. Her talk today is on another interest of hers, um, perhaps related, I haven't heard it yet, um, called Seeing, Being, and Knowing, Reflections on Photography, Ethnography, and Ways of Knowing. I have a pretty loud voice, so uh, this should, please let me know if I'm not close enough to the mic. I usually don't need a mic. So Lee got in touch with me and asked me to speak about ways of knowing, and she encouraged me to do something that took an unusual format. We spoke about 10 days before I went on holidays, and my holiday consisted of spending a week at what I affectionately refer to as Photo Geek Camp, which was a week-long residential photography workshop, followed by two weeks in a Callowit on Baffin Island in the Canadian North. And that my holiday came on the heels of Lee's request, no doubt, became part of my intellectual terrain. Then, while I was on holiday, a dear friend of mine died, and in the aftermath of trying to support her partner, another longtime friend, several interesting conversations occurred, and these two have no doubt influenced the approach that I'll take today. This talk is also, in a sense, a conversation with the preamble that Lee wrote for the conference. Today, I want to try to do three things. First, I want to talk about what we can learn from our way, about our ways of knowing by considering ethnography in relation to photography. My insights here aren't entirely new, but I hope that this ju juxtaposition 
will nevertheless create some new space in ongoing dialogues about multiplicity and knowing. Second, I'm going to tell some stories which for me all say something about ways of knowing. And the stories came out of conversations that I've had with people in my life over a two or three week period recently. And although in my recounting these stories will all seem to you to be about interdisciplinarity, in fact none of the conversations started that way, but rather they started in a very different place, in a much more personal place. So my second point then will have to do with, on the one hand, that the personal, about the personal being political, and on the other hand, reflecting on how we know what we know as interdisciplinarians. Finally, I'm gonna talk about body knowledge, something that's been a significant, uh, has been significant for me throughout my life, uh, but which I seldom speak about. And my discomfort in broaching this topic is so great that for virtually the first time in my academic career, I've come to the podium with written notes. So why is it so difficult to talk about body knowledge in academic settings? I'm gonna suggest that body knowledge plays a significant role in ways of knowing, and that we haven't really begun to grasp how it influences our ways of knowing. Um, my talk today very much comes out of worlds that I inhabit and reflects some of my passions. Um, some people know that I'm a really passionate skier and you're gonna to get to experience that later on. Um, and some of the connections will seem obvious, some obtuse, but they're all related, in a sense, to experiential knowing. And before jumping off of my secure perch, uh, I should also mention that before going on holiday, I'd been training several people with whom I work um, to do field observations in hospitals. And my efforts to train people to be ethnographers, not just ethnographers of technology, but attuned to a range of issues, found me reflecting on how people learn to see. And then off I went to photo camp, where we were encouraged to see differently. So I'm going to try and take you on this journey a little bit. So reflections on photography, ethnography, and ways of knowing. Lee wrote that implicitly there are many ways of knowing any particular object, process, or event, and that some of these ways of knowing have historically been more valued than others. The photographer with whom I studied has commented that sight is the first sense we developed, but it isn't much valued, so that often by the time we get into school we've lost skills associated with sight and visual expression. As academics, we've all excelled in the use and manipulation of words and papers, and for many of us, occupying a world of social sciences and humanities, and worse, occupying the in-between space between those worlds, we're often reminded that we occupy that in-between space. For me, the space is one of being neither a health professional nor a computer scientist, neither a biostatistician nor decision support analyst, neither a sociologist nor an anthropologist. Though I can perform translational work such that I make sense to people whose rudders glide through different waters, they're never quite sure how to introduce me. Their ways of knowing have been dominant, and my ways of knowing are skillfully positioned in relation to their more dominant discourses. I'm able to traverse through their worlds while in mine I can go straight down. Lee wrote that processes of adjudicating ways of knowing have usually been neither nice nor neutral. We know we're inhabiting a world dominated by other ways of knowing because our discourse is often positioned as a response to a more dominant discourse. In grant applications to health funders, the socio-technical tradition in health informatics needs to be contextualized while asking for money to do randomized controlled trials for electronic health record impl implementations would not. In her preamble about the conference, Lee wrote, we're interested in processes of valuation from the language of debates to acts of censorship that result in one way of knowing as the right one or the natural one. Processes of valuation. We know what's valued through direct observation of the world around us. In a busy ICU I worked in, nurses relinquished their chairs to doctors who came around for patient rounds. And although the doctors were temporary inhabitants of the workspace and nurses were there all day, often on their feet while caring for patients, the doctors sat during rounds in the chairs otherwise occupied by the nurses. And this was 2006. Direct observation yielded insights about value, about which professions are valued, and about gender relations. In academic worlds, less dominant discourses respond to those more dominant discourses. Areas of academic inquiry most closely aligned with feelings, such as the arts, are often less valued. Valuation and belonging can hardly be separated. When we belong and follow the dominant paths, we're often rewarded by a smooth journey. And when we don't belong, we receive subtle, and sometimes less subtle, signals that tell us that we don't belong. And I'll return to this point later on. 
Um, Shore wrote that a painter starts with a blank canvas and builds a picture, and a photographer begins with the messiness of the world and selects a picture. Freeman Patterson captured something similar when he wrote that, it's the job of the painter to create, and it's the job of the photographer to reveal. So I'm sure you all were wondering what those weird green images were. And had you had more context, you would have known that I was actually inside of a car in a terrible, terrible rainstorm shooting out through the, the rainy window. And you see the actual um, setting revealed there. So as a photographer, I'm frequently aware that the image I make can be revealed in many ways. At a distance, close up, on an emotive level, in a literal sense, or an abstract sense. That there's no single or right way to make a picture, although photographs have one def definite vantage point. In our lives, we move between different ways of knowing. Last week, I had a meeting with a senior health administrator whom I was meeting for the first time. She asked me to explain what it was that I did, a familiar refrain for me in hospitals. Sometimes people ask me what my background is, which is geography and environmental studies, women's studies, and an interdisciplinary doctorate in computer science, communication, and women's studies. Not that that would help anyone in health sciences <laughs> make sense of what, in fact, I can do for them. But the administrator needed to know to be able to situate me and needed to figure out what my way of knowing was, my ways of knowing were. In our lives, we often move between multiple ways of knowing. And in my world, knowing as a social scientist as opposed to knowing as a hard scientist or not knowing as a medical practitioner, knowing as a cultural Jew. We never went to synagogue in my house, and yet I know I'm a Jew, and I feel a great cultural affinity with Jews, be they Montreal Jews, New York Jews, or Australian Jews. Knowing as someone in a same-sex partnership, which although now legal in Canada, um, I also know from a perspective of having been gay bashed 22 years ago in the city in which I now live. So, and knowing in all sorts of other ways as well. In the nature of photographs, Shore wrote that in the field, outside the, contr the controlled confines of a studio, a photographer is con confronted with a complex web of visual ju juxtapositions that realign themselves with each step the photographer takes. Um, take one step and something hidden comes into view. Photographers simplify the jumble by giving it structure, imposing that order by giving a photograph a vantage point. We choose a frame, a moment, a plane of focus, and this is arguably what ethnographers do. As a slight tangent, it seems to me that enormous amount of writing about ethnography is about collecting ethnographic data and finding the story. But there are comparatively fewer accounts that address the varied analytic frameworks upon which ethnographers rely in framing their stories. And exceptions are uh, one book called Reading Ethnography and also um, Adele Clark's Situational Analysis, Grounded Theory After the Postmodern Turn, fabulous book and uh, both of which take us back to the picture in a sense as academicians with affiliations to particular intellectual communities, discourses, ways of reading our worlds, which become simultaneously ways of knowing our worlds. For sure, photography is inherently an analytic discipline. For Patterson, the goal of photography is effective expression. And when we view photographs, we respond emotionally. Patterson sees photography as a sensory experience and he urges photographers to take advantage of the natural sequence in which one sen one's senses provide information when making pictures. For Patterson, the purpose of a good composition or visual design is to let the subject matter express the subject in one's photograph. Our movements between different ways of knowing is akin to making a picture amidst such complex webs. That we make choices in photographic composition seems as obvious as the fact that we simultaneously create reality through our exploration of it, a point that John Law has made in talking about multiplicity. And yet, we have few ways of expressing multiplicity in our academic worlds. We typically tell stories from singular perspectives, for example, the doctor's perspective on the emergency room information system versus the nurse's perspective on the emergency room information system versus the management perspective on the emergency room information system. 
Uh, but in reality, when we try and bring these perspectives together, something happens. And I had an interesting experience recently. I co-authored a paper with a doctor that I've been working with and um, about a failed emergency room information system um, that the doctor subsequently pulled out. And in the process of writing that paper, she uh, felt comfortable circulating it to a doctor who had made the decision to put the information system in, uh, as well as some other people that had been involved in the process. And it was really interesting for me as the first author of that paper to actually see how it changed as it went through all these different accountabilities. Um, it certainly wasn't the paper that I would have written had I written it alone, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It was certainly a different thing. Uh, photographers know what Mull has, has also observed, that different practices tend to create different perspectives and different realities, what Mull calls the problem of multiplicity. Now reflecting on Mull's work, Locke has commented that realities are not explained by practices and beliefs, but are instead produced in them. They're produced and have a life in relations. And I think one of those relations through which realities are produced is embodiment our relations with our own bodies, the traces of our pasts within our bodies, and our bodies' relations to the world. And I'm going to return to this in a bit. Now, Nina, who's going to speak after me, is also going to talk about some of the contributions that Mull and Law have made um, to STS debates about multiplicity. Uh, and I suppose, in part, my interest in exploring photography here has been partly an interest in providing a means through which to talk about multiplicity and to remind us that there are multiple ways of knowing and to encourage us to explore the other resources at our disposal in our knowing. We tend to anchor ourselves in relation to established ways of knowing in terms of dominant discourses in order to function in the world. So when I met the decision support uh, director last week at the regional health authority that I work with, she asked me about my background so she could figure out how to speak to me and so she could identify what the bounds of our conversation might be, identifying with more dominant and well, and well known ways of knowing or, or more precisely discourses about knowledge helps us to communicate with people um, and so that we can use insider language and, in, and uh, language in particular speech communities, for example. Um, and now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to talk, the, the sort of subheading of this part of the talk is being and knowing and seeing some thoughts in boundary crossing, uh, rule breaking and interdisciplinarity. Uh, I'm going to switch directions for a moment and talk about knowing as a personal thing and then about interdisciplinarity. And I'm going to tell a few stories that'll illustrate, uh, which all illustrated to me something about how we know things. Um, and, and then I'm going to link the stories, uh, all of which are, are personal, back to interdisciplinary sensibilities. So the, the first story, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I've been working with a doctor, an emergency room manager, who um, made a decision to withdraw an emergency room information system, an electronic triage system, because it was just a disaster. It wasn't working for the nursing staff. Work was slowing down. There were all kinds of problems with it. And I realized while we were working on a paper together about this that I actually hadn't really read any other accounts of people removing information systems. And I thought there must have been enormous consequences for this doctor to do this. So after I'd gotten to know her a little bit, I, uh, I felt comfortable asking her about it. And I was kind of interested in whether or not she thought that it, had to, it, it was a gender issue. And uh, I don't actually remember now if I asked her if she thought it was a gender issue. But her response was really fascinating. She said to me, and what you need to know about her is that she's married also to a doctor, and she has four children who span 12 years in age. So uh, as you might imagine, she's had kind of a complicated life looking after all these people. And she said, when I asked her what it was that might have allowed her to take that information system out of the emergency department, she said, I suppose it was like being in the kitchen at our house at dinner time, um, which I found amazing. Uh, such an interesting comment. Um, clearly, I, I, well, I imagine that over the years, she had developed some amazing negotiation and listening skills, not to mention juggling skills, in order to make it all work in what I'm sure has been a very complicated life. And so to me, this story is about how the personal is political and how our everyday experiences shape our abilities to know and about how ways of knowing travel or can be exp 
export it from one domain to another um, in terms of ways of knowing. And this form of knowing, where experiences in one domain allow us to cultivate ways of being or knowing in another, has, I think, for many of us, been foundational to the fact that we're here today at an STS conference um, in an area of study which by its very nature is interdisciplinary. Now the next stories I'm going to tell you um, uh, well, actually, before, I, before talking about that, I need to make a few comments about disciplines. And disciplines are ways that we orient ourselves and our students to a subject matter. They allow us to anchor ourselves in relation to established ways of knowing. And although disciplines aren't rules, they can act like rules. And if we stray too far from the norms, we don't get our grant funding. Our colleagues suggest that we don't know our area. And in these senses, we in fact can be disciplined if we stray too far outside of the disciplinary boundaries. Um, so I think it's important to keep those things in mind. Now, photographers also at times anchor themselves in relation to established ways of knowing. They also have rules, uh, such as the rule of thirds, for example. And basically what the rule of thirds is, is imagine that you've got a tic-tac-toe board on that picture. The rule of thirds says that you should make the focal point of your picture at the intersection of some of the lines. Okay, and the, the thing about the rule of thirds is um, that it'll produce typically good but somewhat predictable kinds of results. So Patterson has suggested that if you cultivate, cultivate flexible thinking in your photographer, photography, that you'll recognize that rules, formulas, or other dominant ideas can become obstacles to seeing rather than aids to better vision and that you, you won't worry about being logical all the time because logic is only one way of developing ideas or viewpoints already acquired, that you'll actively search for new or different ways of looking at things, and you'll shift your point of view when you come up against a problem that seems insurmountable, and that you'll finally, that you'll welcome chance, realizing that can, it can help stimulate completely new ways of seeing and using a camera. So something about this passage resonated for me uh, with my thoughts about interdisciplinarity as well as contemporary debates about multiplicity um, and especially some of the work that's come out recently in John Law's writing. I won't talk too much about that now. As I mentioned, Nina's going to go into that. But I want to talk for a minute about interdisciplinarity. And I'm going to tell you three very short stories and then I'm going to talk about body knowledge. So in the, coincidentally, in the course of the last couple of weeks, I've had really interesting conversations with people um, where they've told me something about their lives, about being outsiders, and um, these, and then at the end of it, they said, you know, somehow I think that that experience of being an outsider has contributed to the fact that I'm an interdisciplinary scholar today. So in the first case, I was speaking to a friend. Um, we had been talking about shame and how shame is passed down through generations, often in spite of the fact that the source of shame is unknown. That's an experience I've had in my family. And it turned out this was an, ex an experience that my friend had had as well. And so when I made this comment about shame being passed down intergenerationally, my friend told me a story about always feeling different, about looking different from her siblings, and um, uh, never quite feeling at ease in the household, and subsequently learning as a young adolescent that, in fact, she felt different because she was different, that she, the, the person that she had grown up with thinking what, that that person was her father was not her biological father, um, and that uh, this was connected to having experienced shame uh, growing up. But at the end of this, this uh, person who is an interdisciplinary scholar just out of the blue said, you know, I, I think that that might have something to do with the intellectual trajectories I've taken through academia. Not a week later, I sat down on a bus on my way to a conference dinner uh, in another country and uh, sat next to somebody who I knew only by name, had never had a conversation with, and we got to talking. And it turned out that this person, like me, was Jewish, had been raised outside of a Jewish community, um, and I was raised going to a Quaker school. This other person was raised in some kind of a Unitarian community. And, um, and then she had gone and lived in Germany and married an Austrian. And I made a comment about that being a kind of complicated identity for 
a Jew. And we ended up getting in this conversation about identities and about being outsiders and so on. And at the end of it, she commented about how she thought that perhaps this had been something that had helped her to develop her interdisciplinary sensibilities. Now, I'll spare you the third story in the interest of time, but suffice it to say, it's actually a very similar story. Um, and uh, while I certainly don't think that it's necessarily true that the path to interdisciplinary enlightenment, to the extent that that exists, um, and to new ways of knowing, which probably most of us would agree require considerably more work uh, than resting easily within a discipline, can only come from not fitting in or being an outsider or living on the borders or out of adversity, I have to say that I was certainly struck by the common thread in these stories. And as I puzzled over this, I was reminded of a comment that a friend of mine who was a clinical psychologist had once made. He had made an observation uh, to me many years ago that people who had grown up um, with lots of excitement in their lives, for ex um, or really in really hard and ab horrible and abusive situations, often sought forms of excitement in their lives. For example, through risk recreation, sports, relationships that were ripe with conflict and so on. And that for such people, that state of adrenaline coursing through the veins or whatever else happens during a fight or flight response, um, that for people who had grown up in really horrible situations, that response was their normal. Um, you could say that the body had a memory of normal as a fight or flight response and that people would pursue activities that would deliver them to what their bodies thought was normal. And that for some of us who have pursued interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary ways of knowing, the sense of not belonging is our normal. It's, uh, it was our normal before we even knew what academic disciplines and interdisciplinarity were. And we can think of it in an odd sort of way as having certain affordances. The familiarity that we've developed through quite varied experiences affords us a level of familiarity with what others might experience as discomfort. Um, and I wonder how many outsider stories there are in this room and for how many of us our bodies, in a sense, bore the imprint of our histories in this way. Now, um, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to go to video mode. And I've already told you that skiing is really my great passion in life. Um, and uh, I'm going to share, however bizarrely, that passion with you for a little while here while I talk about um, body knowledge. So uh, most of us in the room are academics, and we get paid to live in our heads. And what I want to talk about is our bodies, and specifically body knowledge. And I don't think that we yet have a language to talk about body knowledge, though it's beginning to occur. I think that we all can have body knowledge, though I'm not sure that we all have relationships with our body knowledge. But even if we don't have a relationship with our body knowledge or an awareness of it, I think that it nonetheless comes with us into the field and it's present in our research, though often as an untapped resource. So what is body knowledge? The easiest way that I can explain body knowledge is in relation to skiing. Um, I love good snow and sometimes this pursuit of good snow and perf perfect snow and the perfect run or else just the unpredictability of high alpine weather means that I occasionally end up on my skis in inclement weather when, simply put, I just can't see. And if you've never been in a thick mountain fog or a whiteout, when you need to know, um, what you need to know in such circumstances is that you can't tell up from down, although down is where you need to go. And this is one circumstance in which I rely on body knowledge. My body knows how to react, what to do, what muscles to flex, and which to contract, even though one of my other senses, my eyes, can't give me the information they normally would when I'm on skis. My body knows what to do because it's done it countless times before. And that's probably not a bad sense of what a whiteout might be like. Um, actually, I had lunch with my friend Donna yesterday, who's a neurophysiologist, and she explained to me just what happens when that process occurs. She said that reflex connections are made between um, proprioceptive visual, somatosensory, and equilibrium input to muscular and glandular outputs that allow us to make rapid responses. So I'm grateful to Donna for that explanation. Uh, another time that body knowledge comes into things on skis is when I push my envelope of comfort, for example, by hopping over a cornice onto an extremely steep and narrow slope, and I have to believe that my body will know what to do, and amazingly enough, it does. Earlier, I mentioned the fight or flight response, and this is another type of body knowledge where your body remembers something and responds in a particular way based on memory or on sensory recall. But that's only one kind of body knowledge, and there are certainly other kinds of body knowledge as well. 
Um, we all have bodies, and our bodies all have histories in the health and wellness sense. My body, for example, has had four hip surgeries and knee surgery, and I have an artificial hip but also in the life trajectory or embedded in our world sense. And by this, I mean that we've all had experiences just simply as a result of the trajectories that we've taken through life, some of which may have been particular kinds of experience, like the experience of homophobia or the experience of racism or my own particular Achilles heel injustice, which often seems to me to reflect the fact that I'm a woman. My body knows what this feels like. Now, Lee wrote that we're interested in how certain ways of knowing are deemed non-scientific, things like magic and um, astrology and so on. And in some senses, body knowledge is measurable in the sense that we can measure physiological responses and that bodies have in certain uh, circumstances. And this is, I suppose, for example, how the medical sciences diagnose panic. Uh, but what I want to draw our attention to is the messier and the unsci uh, unscientific sense of body knowledge, where you just feel things, you just know things in your body. And sometimes you don't know what it is that you're sensing or feeling, but it's nevertheless a response to or a reaction to an active engagement with the world. And it's part of how we create reality and part of how we know. Sometimes our body knowledge is just about being engaged in our world, and like taking a good picture, we might not stop to figure out what exactly appealed to us before hitting the shutter release. Our body knowledge may be a tacit resource when we sally forth into ethnographic settings, um, but just like our often unconscious emotional response that causes us to make a particular picture, our body knowledge, though often not something we're conscious of, is part of what we know. Madison has actually written about this in relation to ethnography. Um, and Madison has said that meanings and experiences in the field are filtered and colored through sensations of the body, that is, through body knowledge. If we accept that knowledge has infinite organs, origins and forms, we're able to accept knowledge from, our, from the body. Body sensations as body knowledge is, uh, is not to be equated solely with the sensational or feelings of, of arousal, though it certainly includes these elements. Rather, body sensation as body knowledge comprises impressions, and interpretive meaning. Because these knowledges are embedded with meanings that filter and guide our experiences in the field, well obviously, uh, our experiences in the field, they'll obviously inform and influence what we write. We write from our body and we write through our body. Um, I'm just about done, but I do want to make a comment about the work of a woman named Candace uh, Pert who's a PhD trained scientist with a background in physics and biophysics. In her book, The Molecules of Emotion, she explores how the mind, spirit, and emotions are unified with the physical body into a single intelligent system. She's done pioneering research that's demonstrated how our internal chemicals, our neuropeptides in the receptors, are the biological underpinnings of our awareness manifesting themselves in, as our emotions, beliefs, and expectations and how they profoundly influence how we respond to, to and experience our world. From a scientific standpoint, it validates what Eastern philosophers and others have believed for years, that the mind and body are one. So body knowledge does lots of things for us. Um, in skiing, it might teach us how to fall without injury. It can tell us when we're under threat, help us register what we can't make, quite make sense of in a tense meeting, or direct our other senses toward a particular person in a field setting, or perhaps uh, make it more, a more comfortable thing, or at least bearable, to take public intellectual risks. It can support us in looking at the in-between, the absences of what's invisible, or it might just mean that the trajectory, life of li the, the trajectory in life we've taken has left us with physiological traces that make it comfortable in an embodied sense to ask certain kinds of questions. Making sense out of our bodies can help us understand processes through which reality is constructed and can add a resource to our ways of knowing. In John Law's introduction to After Method, Law commented that the world in general defies any attempt to be at overly orderly accounting. And he suggests that it should not be understood by adopting a methodological version of auditing. Law speaks of a need for heterogeneity and, and variation about cultivating and playing with, uh, playing with the capacity to think six impossible things before breakfast, about creating metaphors and images for what's impossible or barely possible, um, unthinkable or almost unthinkable, slippery, indistinct, elusive, complex, diffuse, messy, textured, vague, confused, disordered, emotional, painful, pleasurable, hopeful, horrific, etc. 
all of which create space for the in indefinite. And I hope that I've done that for you a bit today and that perhaps something in what I've said will resonate for you and that it'll provide a perch from which you can further explore methodological multiplicity, which I think will continue to enrich science, technology, and society studies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helen. That's great. Um, we're a little pressed for time, as always happens. Um, our next speaker has been speaking for 36 hours or something like that. Uh, if you attended the beginning of her plenary presentation, um, the videos and the cat's cradle games with students. But it's my pleasure to introduce Nina Wakeford, who will be talking about what you see is what you get. And Nina comes to us from Goldsmiths College of the University of London. Thanks, Lee, and thanks to my assistants down there. Um, the piece that I presented that some of you will have seen and encountered at um, the beginning of the conference was called Untitled. This is the beginning of the presidential plenary. It involved students offering participants a game of cat's cradle and two videos, one of a wagging tail and one of a dog lead. You can go to the next slide. I'm just going to show you probably uh, my favourite thing, which is just a minute of a wagging tail of a dog. And I feel at this point in the conference, um, oops, can we go back? And just need to press some um, click return and it should play. Move the mouse. See, my technical ability is fantastic. There we go. Thank you. There's something about uh, the wagging of a dog's tail happening over and over again at an STS conference that I feel um, <laughs> should hold for us the prospect of new, renewed and basically happy knowledge um, and ways of knowing. <laughs> um, while that's going on, I should say that in the spirit of ways of knowing, making untitled This is the Beginning of the Presidential Plenary forced me to work with a dog at close quarters. <laughs> in fact, at close hind quarters. Shooting the video, editing, reshooting, re-editing, I became aware that I was becoming more and more committed to a certain kind of waggingness, <laughs> which I equated with a certain kind of dogness. I discovered that looping the video on one wag, Candice, the dog in the video, appeared to be wagging to some strange electronic dance beat. So if you just have one wag, it kind of goes boom, 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 boom. And it didn't look very wag-like, happy, or even dog-like. I mean, it looked aesthetic in a certain way, but um, not really what I was going for. To enable a friendly type wag, which I could loop for hours on end, I actually had to have some non-wagging in there, so it became more believable wagging in the end. Even though you still have a slight catch on the video, which you will have seen in that loop, now you can see the movement between not wagging, about to wag, wagging, really wagging, and so on. I called my paper, What You See Is What You Get, partly in recognition of the 1970s computing world where this phrase was supposed to suggest aspirationally uh, the exact correspondence between the representation of on-screen text and how it appeared once you'd printed it out. But even being introduced to the computer, computing world in the 1980s, I very quickly realised that what you see is what you get was mostly used aspirationally rather than constituting anything you could rely on when you printed out your thesis. So, what you see is what you get, question mark. Writing about the public displays that characterised early modern science and the politics of experimentation, Simon Schaffer notes that paying attention to the circumstances of public experiments shows how reversals of force and trials of strength were used to demonstrate powers in nature and, in the same gesture, to evince the powers of the experimenters. Next slide, please. In June of this year, I staged Trials of Strength, an intervention and installation as part of a conference at Goldsmiths. The work consisted of thermometers 
suspended from blue helium balloons. Each thermometer was held aloft by one balloon. I arranged groups of balloons around the speaker's podium and amongst the audience so that thermometers hung at eye level. What the audience for this installation saw, if they looked more closely, was that thermometers were uncalibrated. All traces that would have allowed the exact mapping of the mercury levels to some external system of measurement had been removed. Yet these were real mercury thermometers with levels rising and falling as the day progressed and the air in the room warmed and cooled. They weren't actually to measure the amount of hot air in the room, but that was uh, suggested uh, as, as one interpretation by the participant, rather disgruntled participant. Um, attaching the thermometers to the balloons physically connected two objects that exist in a starkly contrasting system of cultural connotations, scientific versus popular, functional versus decorative. One trial evoked physical material properties, latex, helium, glass, Mercury. I'd been reading Heisok Chang's History of Thermometers, brought to my attention by Sally Wyatt on hearing about this installation, and this documents the historical battles about the capabilities of different liquids in the attempt to measure temperature. In the installation, the thermometers had returned to a state without numbers or scales. Their presence was linked to the properties of helium rather than merely the mercury. So what are the material qualities of the empirical here? And how to present the problems of representation rather than merely assume that such work is purely representational, illustrative, or decorative? I called the piece Trials of Strength, recalling the STS language. Although as soon as I titled it, I began to worry what this act of giving it a title did to the work. I was reminded of Susan Sontag's observation that captions are sometimes treated as if they can save a photo. I'm still not sure whether it evinced my power as an experimenter, an STS scholar, or even an artist. Next slide, please. The piece of work I've shown at this conference, untitled, this is the beginning of the presidential plenary, consisted of two video loops and an ongoing distribution of Cat's Cradle by students in the lobby. And there's some tremendously skilled people doing Cat's Cradle in the STS community. If you wanted to take nothing else away from um, this installation, uh, there were some really amazing um, patterns, teacups, things that uh, I and the students have never experimented with ourselves. Um, can you just skip through the next video? Just do double click and we won't show that bit of video. Okay, thanks. Um, I think there's an uncertainty of in-betweenness as well as an interest in the perils of interpretation driving my talk today. In creating installations such as Trials of Strength and the one I did for this conference, I actually work first and foremost what my body knowledge tells me to do with the norms and practices of contemporary installation art, or at least as far as I'm beginning to understand them, which include a concern for aesthetics, by which I don't mean that things have to be beautiful, a valuing of ambiguity, and often aspirations towards some kind of poetics emerging out of site-specific work. I should say a couple of words on what I mean by this installation. Using Susan Hiller's um, explanation of the concept in contemporary art, I understand installation as something that occupies a particular site in a way that objects, spaces, light, distances and sounds, everything that inhabits that site, everything is defined by its relationship to all the other things. So nothing in installation means anything except in relationship. So many of the struggles which come to the fore in the day-to-day -day making of such work could be understood as a direct consequence of my engagement with the norms and practices and histories of art making. And yet, I can't avoid the fact that the knowledge and ways of knowing which I bring to this work are of course the result of long-term embeddedness in anthropology, sociology and STS. 
When first thinking about how to create a piece of work which would function alongside the 4S conference, without a clear idea of the very particular, very particular aesthetics of this hotel, <laughs> I began considering the metaphors and narratives of STS. I noticed companion species are a continuing interest. The human-dog lead hybrid has been aired on more than one occasion as an instance of an actor network actant um, on one occasion by my colleague at Goldsmiths, Mike Michael. Cat's Cradle is not just a way of creating string figures, but also recalls Donna Haraway's article of 1994, A Game of Cat's Cradle, Science Studies, Feminist Theory, Cultural Studies, in which she reminds us that the Cat's Cradle, quote, invites a sense of collective work, of one person not being able to make all the patterns alone. So a knowledge of constructions from current STS, particularly feminist STS, was my starting point. Familiar figures were an attempt at a seduction into a different way of knowing. It was at this point in writing the text I got stuck the more I began to talk about intention and interpretation of what I was making, or more accurately, my intention and audience interpretation, the more uncomfortable I became. Walter Benjamin observed that the longer you look at a word, the further away it gets. I want to think further about this unease. On the face of it, surely this sense of awkwardness is uncalled for among this audience. Some parts of STS have a generous inclusivity about methods and methodologies. And yet, there are silences and resistances to looking or even engaging in a game of cat's cradle. Anticipating this, I wrote a script for the students to begin the cat's cradle invitation, which said, this is the beginning of the presidential plenary. It is a work by Nina Wakeford. It's a game of cat's cradle. They modified this, I realise, and that's the issue of collaboration with um, people in, in live performance. But that was the script that I intended as the invitation um, to make clear that this just wasn't a game going on in reception. It was a piece of work. Many feminists, including Lee Starr, have used poetry as, whether, as well as other non-conventional, non-hegemonic written forms as ways of knowing about science and technology. Um, one of the, in the interest of time, I'm going to cut a section here on, on going through all that kind of work, but I do want to point out one of the most provocative questions, um, I think, in creating different kinds of knowledges um, was Lee's question in her 1994 article, 